76 uh, final, I can remember very little about it except awe and delight that we were so far ahead. We're coming up to the final whistle and Dublin are Ireland champions of 1976. And they fully merited the victory. They took a net for each side on the hill. I couldn't believe that we would uh, beat Kerry to such an extent. Uh, I was confident that we could win, but uh, the, the manner of the defeat was what thrilled and, and delighted me. The great honour for me to accept this trophy on behalf of the Dublin team. I'd like to thank the men most deserving in winning this cup, Lorcan Redmond, Donald Hunter, and particularly Kevin Heffernan. Well, every single man Jack played as hard as. There were fellas there at the end of that game, and they were out on their feet. And I think it was a marvellous exhibition for an All Ireland final. I don't, I don't really know whether it was a good match or a bad match. To be honest about it, I'll have to wait to see the television tomorrow. As far as I'm concerned, the result was what we were looking for. If we'd lost today, I think we just might have begun to believe the myth that we couldn't beat Kerry. Kevin, uh, he had an obsession about Kerry. And he wanted to be a Kerry. Um, I, I jumped to tea that, that 76 team, they were, they were butt off. In preparation and studying Kerry and all the different psychological things about it. And I mean, to have won it was, was a fantastic achievement, you know. Jimmy Gray, chairman of the county board, what have you to say about it all now? Well, I think all I have to say, Mick, is that I think Kevin Heffernan has waited since 1959 to get revenge for that particular match, and he's done so, I think, quite comprehensively today. Kind of a euphoric feeling that I experienced, uh, and uh, a feeling that, well, at least that coast was laid. One of the most significant aspects of the 1977 season, and one that's not well remembered in Gaelic football history, is that Kevin Heffernan was no longer in charge of the Dublin Gaelic football team. Heffo, as he was fondly known, had decided after the unprecedented success in the 76 National League and the championship win over Kerry that it was time to step down. Kevin Heffernan came on the scene in the Dublin uh, senior team somewhere around 1950 and as I say was involved right up as a player up to nearly up to 62, 63. The famous meeting took place in the, in the Gresham Hotel where we all met and Kevin announced his retirement. Uh, I have a feeling I might have met him sometime approaching that date where he indicated to me that he was and I think he probably said that he'd nominated me to take over. Uh, now that could have been two or three days before we were in the Gresham. I, I don't really remember but I do remember the Gresham very well and uh, that's what he said and uh, it wasn't a popular decision with a lot of people because we felt we had a winning team and a winning format and uh, Essentially, he was the manager of the team and it was going to leave, leave a, a big hiatus there and a lot of people were sorry to see him go. It came as a bit of a shock because, you know, we thought, we, we thought yeah, we'd, we'd continue on. I certainly wasn't expecting it. I don't know whether other players knew about it or not. The more senior players may have done. Um, I certainly didn't know. And um, it came as a right bombshell altogether. And I suppose, in a sense, it was a time for reflection a couple of weeks afterwards where we would have had an open forum where we could talk about the things that went well, the things that went wrong, what we could have done better, both individually, collectively, from management point of view, even the players themselves would be making suggestions to the management as to what we should do or change. He was replaced by Tony Hanahoe, the Dublin captain, who now had a threefold job with the All-Ireland Champions as captain, manager and selector. The Dublin football fan must have worried about the future. But as the events of 1977 were to prove, they had nothing to fear. I accepted immediately, and, and uh, I have to say that it was uh, you know, a, a great compliment to Donal and Lorcan that they were, they were prepared to join uh, in their support of me and allow me to, to play so many roles. And I suppose uh, I was also grateful for the support of the players. Uh, and it wasn't a situation at that stage where we could have brought in an outsider. The succession would be easily done as well because 
Everybody respected Tony, respected him as a captain and respected him as a leader then as well. And we knew then we could continue, you know, with, with Tony at the helm. It also was very difficult for me, uh, I must admit, to have to censure certain teammates if that was what re was required. But it had to be done. If you were to sustain both of the roles or three of the roles or four of the roles, that's what you had to do. And I think it was respected, but I, I tried to deal with it in as firm and as honest a way as I could. I, I, I honestly don't know how physically and mentally it's possible to do those, job, do those three, four jobs, essentially, together. And you can add in other peripheral jobs as well because the management role takes with it other ones. You have PR in problems, you have trying to control PR situations, um, and you have the whole backroom group to, to deal with it as well. Tony took over was a National League match in um, Croke Park, and I forget now, and Dublin were dire. Dread when everybody was saying, oh, there's the wrong, wrong decision to make a point to player manager. And as a transport, <laughs> it wasn't, you know, but at that, just in one match, people were prepared to make a judgment. You know? Dublin and Kerry played in the league final in 1977, which was about June of 77. That's Milan, this is Mike Sheehy. That's John Egan. He has a chance at the goal. Johnny. A difficult angle, but can Jimmy put the lead to a point? When he does that, the umpire signals his colleague to put it up. I actually could have won the game for Dublin, and I had, had a particularly bad miss, but towards the end of the game. Number 17, this is Anton O'Toole. Anton O'Toole to Keevney. Jimmy Keevney is in the large parallelogram. Out to Tony Hanno, and he kicks it wide! But quietly, I wasn't too perturbed, because uh, I'm a little bit of a racing man, and I didn't want to peak too soon, and I certainly didn't want to... to um, expose ourselves to the media who would start a, an immediate campaign to say that Dublin were going to be favourites and they were going to win and they were going to do all these things. What I remember most about the game was that we, we had the upper hand in the middle and I think Kerry brought in the super sub at the time, Sean Walsh, who you know had a major impact on that game. But there it is, it's all over and Kerry are the National League champions taking the title away from the holders, Dublin. But again, when Kerry beat us, uh, is sort of stuck in our throat. And that rivalry had developed at that stage with Kerry. And we weren't going to let it happen again. We'll see what happens. If we can get a good run in the championship, we might uh, be able to reverse the situation sometime later on this year. In the semi-final of 77, mm. do you, is that a very sort of fond moment for you? Or is oh, it, it is, yeah. yeah. And you were going to ask me, do I remember it? Yeah. I, no, I, I, I was trying to think it, I remember it. <laughs> <laughs> I watch it every night almost. Do you? I do, yeah, yeah. Then coming into the... The game everybody talks about is the 70s. Till the final whistle was blown, it, the intensity of it was, was incredible. He's ready, and the game is on. And Kerry's John Egan, the first to break away. Into Forty Lynch. Oh, a short one, an intended pass out there to Jack O'Shea. Very quickly intercepted there by David Hickey. This is Anthony O'Toole. Gerald Keith slipping there, quickly taken by Bobby Doyle into Jimmy Keeveney. A shot and it's wide. Oh, Jimmy, oh, Jimmy, oh, Jimmy. We've always said that we're always, within, we're always within range. We're always good enough. We always had the ability. We always had the strength. If we buckle down, 
get our mind into it. Get focused and t attack the ball. Don't wait for the ball to come to you. Go and meet the ball, attack the ball. The ball and not quite holding on to it. That's Sean Doherty. Referee waving him on. And we were, we were always chasing that game because I think uh, Sean Walsh got a goal early on. And Sean Walsh has it, it's a goal! A goal for Kerry! I think, you know, Kerry were probably four or five points up at one stage in the first half. And now he's no longer alone as he tries to burst his way through, takes his shot and scores his point. Got two points just before the break. I got one and I think Jimmy got one. Bobby Doyle is out centre half forward and Gerald Keith has gone after him. Nice bit of feeling in the centre of the field by Brian Mullen. Up now towards, towards Hanaho. He gets it down now towards Antelo too. Anton shot is high, it's good and it's a point. Jimmy Keithley. And the point narrowing the gap now. Which reduced the margin to, I think, two points or three points where it had been, I think, five. So we were, I think we were, we were either two or three points down at halftime. And he did, boy. Halftime whistle is gone. It's a Kerry men lead, one goal and six points to Dublin, six points. And those last two points that Dublin got just before the interval, they took the nasty look from the Dublin point of view off the scoreboard and would give them a lot more heart in that dressing room than they would have had without them. Funny enough, I've no recollection of things said at halftime. Um, so, you know, so I, I must admit, regardless of whatever game it was, I can't remember at any time ever having, there's never been panic within the dressing room. And that's Kevin Boren breaking away for Dublin, just as he did in the All-Ireland final at the start last year. He's in front of the goal, he takes his shot, a hopping ball in. It was time to, to throw anything that was in the tank at it. And I think that's what I think a number of sort of players did that. And even if there was only a fraction of a chance of getting the ball, people started throwing themselves in. And a couple of things just broke right, and there was the quality in the team to capitalise on it. And then, early in the second half, John popped up with the goal that, you know, set the ball rolling. This is Gail Driscoll gone back 50 yards from his own goal. Tommy Drum. Bobby Doyle. Tommy Drum. John McCarthy getting his fist in across the front of Tony Hanaho. It, it must be, it is, it's a goal. John McCarthy, the scorer. Hanaho, in fact, was heavily involved in the goal. Uh, Tommy Drum dropped a high ball in around uh, the square. Somebody else knocked it on. Hanaho got onto it. Tim Kennelly knocked it away from Hanaho. And McCarthy was deadly in around that five yard box followed up and threw it into the back of the net. So uh, uh, it was uh, it was even Stephen at that stage. And Kerry came back at us and they, they went ahead again and they, they were they were always ahead and we were always catching up. And uh, I, I mean it was anybody's game up to the last the last ten minutes. <laughs> David Hickey, at a certain stage of his career, believed that anybody could score a point, that uh, the, real, the real kudos was to score a goal. And he used to, when we were training, he'd spend a lot of time standing 10 or 12 feet in front of Cullen, slamming the ball at him, which Cullen, naturally enough, was complaining away about, and used to say to Hickey, look, you're wasting your time. You'll never get that close in a match. Taken by Brian Mullins. Antonio too. And 
Tony Hanno has it now in in front of the goal. It's a goal! And the day he scored that goal was exactly he got the ball in exactly the position that he'd been standing in training and he made no mistake about it. And I mean, Tony put me through and I mean, I couldn't miss. Yeah. Yeah, it's like these magic moments. I'm sure you have them on stage when you, mm. you everything just clicks right. and you yeah. couldn't miss. You know, yeah. you just couldn't put a foot around. They're very rare for me on stage, but they. Well, that's the only goal I, I, I ever scored that I can remember. <laughs> I remember Sean Doherty's uh, catch. It was a very high catch in around the square. Sean just seemed to rise and rise in the air. It was a tremendous catch, and then he burst himself out. And... Okay, Moran, but he shot in towards the goal. Oh, what a save by Sean Doherty! I think Okay Moran took a free from about. 50 or 60 yards out and drilled it in and I got up in the air and caught it. As I was coming down, Kevin Moran ran under me and upended me completely. And I thought that the whole thing was gone, but when I landed on my back, I still had the ball in tight, so it was a matter of getting out of there as quickly as I could with it. I'm Doherty. and anxiety of the whole lot of them. This is David Hickey coming away now. This is Tony Hanahoe. In now to Bernard Brogan. He's in front of the goal. He can't miss. He has it. Tony was in possession and Bernard came out of nowhere up alongside him and was passing him like a train and he, Tony just transferred the ball to him. Obviously it was a, a better idea for Tony or to give it across to Bernard, which he did. And Bernard saw it down another couple of yards and drilled the net. I mean, he just was like a gazelle through the, through the Kerry defence. It was a great game of football, but not only that, it was the way all of a sudden it was Dublin's game and then it went Kerry's game and then it came back to Dublin the game. And that seesaw effect, you know, really keeps supporters and everybody enthralled. And you look at the tapes again, it's very hard for me to judge uh, uh, because I was there and I was playing and I was part of it. So it's hard for me to say that, you know, was it the greatest game of all time? Of course it was the greatest game of all time as far as I am concerned. Hello, Keith. And there's the final whistle and Dublin has qualified for the All-Ireland final of 1977. I think it's something you really only appreciate afterwards when you look back on the game. Um, when you're involved in the game itself, you're just absorbed in it, that you just can't step back from it and go, wow, what a game. You would have known it was a great game, but I think it takes watching it afterwards to just realise just how good a game it was. If I try and step back and look at it, I do think that uh, it, and I try and look at it objectively, I do think it probably was the greatest game of Gaelic football of all time. It had everything. It never stopped. The play, you never stopped. Talk about exhaustion, mental exhaustion after that match. You never had a time to relax the whole game. You know, it went from end to end, right through the whole game. All the skills of Gaelic football, great scores, great goals, great points, fielding, high fielding, you know, all that, every, everything about, you couldn't, you'd be very, no, there were mistakes made, there's no doubt about that, but that lent, that had lent to, the, to the excitement of the thing. To me, the crescendo was the 77 semi-final. That was the height of our power, I think. And it was also a game, it was like a, a horse race to me, or a, or a boxing match. It was, you know, we, we came at the right time, we won it the right way, and it was unfortunate for whatever team was going to lose that match, because to, only my opinion, I thought that was a great match. But when you're involved in it, you don't have time for sitting back and looking at it. To me, it was the, the pressure, the play, what happened, and the end. You, you know now how players change their jerseys, and a new set of jerseys for nearly every match. When in those days, the jerseys were always, always collected up and put in a bag and brought back and washed and used for the next day. And Jim King, I, we were coming across Croke Park at the end of the match, and everybody was saying, well done, great game, marvellous game.